What up, y'all? This is uh, Eric Washington, and uh, I just wanted to hit y'all with a little memoir while I had some natural light out. Um, as you know, this is for my kids and my kids' kids. But if you lean with, rock with, roll with what I'm saying, I appreciate the heck out of y'all. But look, listen, I wanted to... Uh, talk a little bit about the idea of being forgotten when you're gone um, I'm sorry I know I'm always a downer I know I'm always talking about memories and going into the essence and um, what happens after you but uh, I just wanted to discuss that because I had a really I had a really bad bout of uh, imposter syndrome during class this afternoon uh, really, really, really bad. Just slapped me in the face today. Everyone was talking about the spring, bla spring break plans and everyone's now talking about the summer plans. And um, anyone who knows where I go to grad school knows that these people are the A1s of the A1s, man. Um, these people are going to be your next congressmen, governors, senators, joint chiefs of staffs head of this agency, head of this organization, these people are, are the people to know, uh, the people to watch in the next coming years. And I just had a really big, like, thing of like, why am I here? Should I be here? None of these people know me. Uh, no one's talking to me in class. No one's asking how my spring break was. All that stuff, man. Just a lot of, a lot of imposter syndrome type stuff. And I've been talking with my counselor about it and we've kind of narrowed down my feelings of self-worth and my feelings of, of wanting to be seen and understood and immortalized, why I do these memoirs, why I make music, why I want to act and why I want to work in social justice, why I want to be part of the black community, why I want to live and die and be active for the black community, all this other stuff. We've kind of narrowed it down to this idea where I kind of overthink and maybe not overthink but where I think about the idea of mortality um, more than the average person this idea of being forgotten more than the average person um, and that's neither here nor there about whether or not that's healthy whether that's safe but it's something that I definitely feel like I need to talk to someone about professional about and so we've kind of narrowed it down to that <laughs> and uh Basically, um, I just want to talk about that, man, because I, I meant to do this more so right after we came to that breakthrough in my session, but um, I, I really I really wanted the fates to kind of stir the juices up of whether or not I should dive deep into that. And at the end of the day, man, um, I got to thinking, because I kind of have this conflict, because... So I understand that I don't want to be forgotten. I, I make these memoirs and I make my music and I make these, uh, these efforts to act on screen um, to kind of immortalize myself while doing something that I love and care about. Um, even my music distributor, one of the reasons I chose them is because they have an option that's called Leave a Legacy. Uh, if any of you know what DistroKid is, this is not a plug by the way, but the main reason I, I, I switched over from TuneCore to DistroKid was because they have an option called Leave a Legacy. So even when I die, my music stays on uh, DSPs, digital service platforms, because um, I I want I want I want a part of me to be out there when I die. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. I say that to say because so I I we got that breakthrough in counseling, and I was thinking. So, I, I said in session, it'd be really, it's really, really crazy to think that after you die, you have the grieving stage, you have the funeral, um, your job, and I've been very outspoken about the idea of not living for your job, um, whether you love it or you don't, because that job, that office, that department will replace you moments after you die. They'll do a, they'll do a sentimental email, and then they'll probably hold some sort of memory of you during the lunch hour, 
and then they got your position up on Indeed or whatever monster career build whatever they use now they have that they have your position on there the next the next day next couple of days um but then i thought about that on a more macro level and i'm thinking about so like your kids and your kids kids and your kids 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 and your kids 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 they'll you know they they won't remember you they they'll forget you um after a while, that that after a few generations, they don't even know who you are. You won't be on you won't be on the forefront of their mind. You won't be, um, you won't be really thought of like that. And so I thought about that on a macro level, and I'm thinking, man, like there are people here. They're like there there are people here with thoughts and feelings and stories and experiences, and they could die tomorrow. And I'll have never met them. I'll have never acknowledged them. I'll have never spoken with them. I, I, I'll walk by them every day. Or I'll walk by them on the street. Or I'll open the door for them. Or I'll say hi about them. But I'll never know them. I'll never understand their story, their experiences. And that got me into this kind of idea of really being good to people. And really seeing all sides of a person and understanding the complexities and nuances of a person and understanding that that people and that mindsets and that ideals and are much bigger than that. But I have these 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 hard times of, of dealing with that when I deal with these imposter syndromes because one in my head I'm I'm not I'm not hardwired to to be outgoing unless someone's outgoing with with me first. So I'm not hardwired to perform that way. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I'm like this, but they know that one of the very first things I say about myself is that I'm not the type to initiate a conversation. Excuse me. I'm not the type to initiate a conversation. I'm more so the type to, or if someone comes up to me, um, I can talk to you like I've known you forever. It's not a problem. It's not an issue. Um, I try not to be awkward around people. I try to be welcoming and loving and open around people. But it's very, very, very hard for me. Uh, it's very, it's very much the social anxiety of me to, to initiate conversation first. Very rarely does that happen, and usually it only happens because I, it's, it's, a, a almost life and death situation for me, or it's a uh, job or no job, salary or no salary, money or no money situation for me. So it's definitely like that. Um, so I have these like very like social anxiety thoughts in my head. Um, and today, you know, dealing with this imposter syndrome and dealing with this idea of like, you know, being the only kid in class who isn't like super, like the super clean cut suit wearing, uh, clean haircut I'm rocking a man bun you can barely see it because my big forehead is blocking the way this big forehead which I'm very self-conscious about um but yeah and so and I think about I think about little things like that about how I don't appear like a public servant even though that's what I'm in school for and how I don't you know appear uh to be this super type a future public servant future congressman, future governor, senator type person, you know, I, I don't appear this way, and I definitely, I, I also get this imposter syndrome because I just, I feel as if everyone, everyone next to me, the person next to me, the person across the room from me is much more prepared, um, they have a lot more background knowledge or background experience, we have a lot of experienced people where I go to graduate school who just understand and who know, and it's not like I'm not like that. Like when it comes to the classwork, like I can master the classwork, but this extra knowledge that everyone has, it's, it's definitely not on par. And so then I have these ideals, these, these, these worries in my head about, you know, as someone, as, as someone who identifies as, as a black male, despite whatever genealogy, um, I understand that I have to be twice as good to be half of where my counterparts are. And I do say counterparts on a macro level at where I go because I am one of the very few 
people of color, let alone um, African Americans. And actually, uh, the, one of the the head of diversity didn't even see me as an African American. He pointed to someone who was actually a, a, a African European, and because uh, he said that was the only African American, didn't even bother to look at me. But hey, I mean, I guess I can't sort of blame him because I don't look the part, whatever that means. Which is problematic in itself, but that's a side note. Um, so I, I was dealing with that, and I was dealing with this imposter syndrome, and I was dealing with you have to be twice as good, but are you really twice as good, Eric? And are you really, are you, are you really, uh, should you really be here? Uh, did you just get lucky? Um, was someone taking a chance on you? Are you a guinea pig? Are you an experiment? Um, and then also thinking about, well, you know, put yourself out there, meet people pick their brains, exchange information, get their suggestions and recommendation. Um, and that's just hard for me. And, and long story, not so long, I didn't do it. I didn't reach out to people and say, hey, how was your spring break? Hey, how did you, how do you know that? Where did you, where did you find that information? Can you cite that? Uh, you know, I didn't do that. Um, and it really brought me down because I'm already dealing with, with stuff, other stuff outside of class. And it just really brought me down. And I really need to talk about it to my memoir in case someone is feeling it and um, in case my kids and my grandkids, if you see this and, and you you want to understand or hear someone's thoughts about it, um, yeah, I, I, I really wanted to, uh, I really wanted to, to, to talk about that. But going back to the idea of not being forgotten and how I, I wanted to create a climate of where I'm really digging deep with people, not just small talking, not just fluff, not just sugarcoating, but really being direct and understanding and learning from people. Um, my head came up with all these conflicts about how I could or couldn't do that. One, going back to my issue this afternoon, with kind of withholding myself from from being outgoing, but also I think about like like these nuanced things because we live in a world nowadays where, um, especially political, and you could look at the time date and kind of look at what the culture was like now in America. Um, but we live in this world where everything's very very, at least with social issues, where everything is very black and white. And I always immediately try my best to lean on the right side of history, um, and, and there and that that may be coded for something else, um, but I always try to be on the right side of history on social issues. Um, but you kind of get these these moderate ideals because I tend to think of myself as somewhat moderate. You get these moderate um, intellectuals who very much are, are very uh, take a step back, look at it from all sides get the full story. And while I agree with that, uh, I battle with myself because, um, like I look at someone like I, I, and this is a very extreme example, but I think about, well, this person stands for, for this and I completely disagree with it. And I, and, and, or I think it's deplorable. Um, so should that mean that I dive deep into this person and, show them this 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 new climate eric in that they won't be forgotten um i think of people i argue i don't really argue on social media anymore but i think of people who i would have argued with on social media or who i would have argued with and they have a platform i think of like we look at the time date we look at these people like like the 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 murderer the mass murderer the terrorist i'll just say it for what it is um, in New Zealand, you know, had I met him on the street when I was, when I just had went through my breakthrough with, um, my counselor, would I have really dug deep into him and, and showed him love and, and adoration and, um, because I wanted, I wanted him to not feel like he'd be forgotten. Um, and I'm not going to go into the cause and effect of that, but just like, I can obviously, obviously, well, I can't say uh, I should say obviously, but I can't because there's some people here who are still caping for him. But um, like I obviously think what he did was horrible, deplorable. I don't think he really should be. I think what he what he did and what his his 
and what caused him to think of these things. I think they should be remembered and they should be changed. And they, they're, there are things that should be changed about what would cause him to do such a thing. But do I think he deserves that, that benefit of being immortalized and being, being remembered throughout time? No, but then again, who am I to say that he shouldn't be remembered? He should be completely forgotten, erased from history. Um, and I will just say, I do believe that he should be forgotten and erased from history. But that essence of of why, his motive, the systems in place that caused him to feel like he had the right or he had the desire or had the necessity, the need, uh, the passion to go out and, and murder these people. Um, I think that should be remembered so it can be, it can be changed. But who am I to say that him as a person, from who he was as a child up until now, these complexities and nuances, because no one, no one as a child grows up and, and thinks that when I'm 30, 40 years old, I'm going to hate people so much that I'm going to go out and murder a bunch of them. And I'm kind of getting off topic, but, I'm, but the essence of what I'm saying is, is that people, they go from zero years old to 80, 90, 100 years old. And these are people with ex years of experience and stories. And I'm trying to figure out how to navigate people who I would just, who I completely, like, just completely want, have nothing to do with um, whether they are, and I won't even put it on the spectrum, but just people I'd have nothing to do with regardless of who they are. And then people who I genuinely love and care about. And then people in the middle who I just don't know who I feel about with yet. How do I go about showing them love and affection and uh, making sure they're not forgotten? And the conflict with that is like, who am I to decide that? And at the, who am I to decide whether or not they, sh they shouldn't be in my in this climate of, of, of open arms and who am I to decide that they should, maybe they don't even want to be, maybe they want to be forgotten, which is a whole nother conversation. But as you can see, I am very, my, my mind frame is not very streamlined. Um, and none of these memoirs ever are, um, but I want my kids and my grandkids to understand what I was like and to learn from, from what I'm saying. But, um, man, I guess I just say that to say, and if you know this, this memoir series, you know, I'm, I try to stay away from cliche sayings, but I guess the idea is just to say like, um, I guess just understand that people are complex and people are nuanced and people have rich and unique stories and experiences. And this isn't a cry for help. I don't want people to see this and when they see me feel like they're obligated to try and get to know me or obligated to acknowledge me in the room or know who I am. Although that would be immensely nice and that's something I talked to my counselor about. This is not a cry for help, a cry for obligation. This is more so something that I want people to understand and more so a, a verbal record of me saying that this is something I wanna practice. Um, I, I really want I really want people to understand and I really want my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids and down the line, I, I want them to understand, you know, that we are like these living, breathing storybooks. And I think oftentimes, especially if you live in a huge city like New York or LA, we just literally walk by people and not acknowledge their existence. Like, and I'm not saying go around saying, Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? You know, I'm not saying do these like weird nonsensical things to go out of your way to, to meet someone or to acknowledge that they they exist. But I'm saying just do that. Just acknowledge that they exist. Give eye contact, you know, like shake someone's hand firmly, give good hugs, like be direct with the person, really take the time to like speak to them 
don't I, in this could even go as far as marriages like I feel like households we give we give pecks on the cheek and we give pecks on on, on the lips and we say hey have a good day hey I got, I'm running late gotta go but like like these these those could be the very last moments that you have with someone like like people with natural disasters I'm sure a lot of people with natural disasters they were stuck at work or stuck stuck at school and these were people they intended to spend their last moments with these weren't people they really like loved and cared about. This wasn't their family and friends. I think of people in, in um, active shooter situations. These weren't people that they loved and cared about. These are just people that happened to be around that they that they that they that they died with, you know. And I'm not saying that they had to love those people. What I'm just saying is that like I I think if we just have a better practice of understanding that of understanding what it is to acknowledge someone and to be around someone and understand that literally every single moment of your life, every single second could be the last second. Um, I think if we kind of uphold that ideal and, and practice it, more people would feel acknowledged. Um, just simple things like eye contact being intentional in a conversation, not letting your mind go a million different ways while you're having a conversation with someone. People will use multitasking as an excuse, and God bless you if you can truly multitask, but I, I think it says something, whether or not people are conscious of it, I think it says something that people take a moment to step away from what they're doing and just connect with the person, you know? So, moral of the story. Moral of the story. Just take your time with each other. Take your time with each other. Don't let your mind race. Don't multitask. Just take your time with each other and really enjoy the other person. I'm out.